Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation VNEC. Space is quite expensive. With our current propulsion technology, it takes roughly three days to travel to the moon and anywhere from half a year to a year to get to Mars. Our closest neighboring star, Alpha Centauri Proxima, is about 4.34 light years away. And with our current propulsion technology, it would probably take us tens of thousands of years to get there, which kind of makes the journey almost impossible. Now, we do have designs like a nuclear thermal engine, which has never been built, but it's definitely possible with our current technology. NASA scientists estimate that even with this type of propulsion, the trip would still take a thousand years. Even theoretical propulsion systems like fusion rockets or solar sails will still make a four light year trip long enough to take up a good portion of a human's lifespan. And then we're not even sure if FTL speed travel is possible at this point, so traveling to another system will be really, really difficult. Now, one of the ways we can make sure that the human crew on board can survive these long trips is by putting them in some sort of hibernation that prevents them from aging. This way, the crew won't have to waste a good portion of their life sitting inside of a spaceship hurtling through deep space. This will also decrease the amount of food, oxygen, and other supplies you would need to carry on the ship, which would save a lot of money in space. The hibernation chambers can also be placed in a safe spot deep within the ship that is shielded from radiation and other physical dangers. The point is humans are incredibly difficult to keep alive in the barren desert that is deep space. Putting them on ice would probably make this extremely long trip a lot easier to plan for. In science fiction, there are plenty of different methods of putting people into hibernation. Today we're going to look at just exactly how we would be able to do it in real life for our future trips to Mars and beyond. Perhaps the most famous method of hibernation we see in films is carbonite freezing from Star Wars. In the Star Wars universe, there is FTL speed travel which is done through hyperspace. It basically only takes days to cross the entire galaxy, and the only thing that really slows down space travel in Star Wars is gravitational anomalies. So instead, carbonite is used mainly by bounty hunters and law enforcement to freeze criminals for transportation. Once they reach their destination, they can then be safely unfrozen. Carbonite was a liquid substance made from carbon gas. An individual would be dipped inside of this carbonite, and when it froze, the organic matter was preserved as well. There were, of course, some dangers with carbon freezing. The individual that is frozen can experience carbon sickness or hibernation sickness, which can kill an individual if it's serious enough. The milder side effects are temporary blindness, disorientation, migraines, and nausea. But most of the time, people who were frozen in carbonite did not die. Although the longer they were frozen, the more likely they would contract hibernation sickness. Now, it was said that in ancient times, before hyperspace travel was invented, the ancient civilizations of Star Wars would use sleeper ships that would travel for many generations to the Outer Rim. In this case, they did use carbonite to freeze the colonists on board so that they wouldn't die in the middle of the journey. So is there something like carbonite in real life? Well, freezing organic matter definitely preserves it for longer periods of time. That's how we keep American Ben's body from decaying when he's not appearing on the channel. The main problem with freezing human beings is the fact that our bodies are made up of 60% water. The brain and the heart are 73% water, the lungs are 83%, and our skin is 64%. Muscles and kidneys are 79%, and even our bones are 31% water. If you guys have ever placed too much water in an ice cube tray in the freezer, you'll notice that the water, when frozen, takes up a lot more space than when it's in liquid form. So one of the biggest problems with the water inside of our bodies when we're frozen is that it actually expands and does all sorts of terrible damage to our flesh. And so when most organisms are exposed to below freezing temperatures, blood vessels all over their body will expand to the point where they burst. Which is really only the beginning of the problems you face when you freeze organic matter. Now, here on Earth, the most capable and most advanced machines we have are still organic ones crawling around in nature. By observing nature, maybe we can figure out exactly how we can get around this problem of our blood vessels exploding when we freeze ourselves. Humans are what is known as endotherms, aka warm-blooded. This means that no matter what the external temperatures are, our bodies will try to regulate our internal heat. It's kind of like central air. When humans get cold, we shiver in an attempt to raise our body temperature, and if we get extremely hot, we sweat in order to release heat. The negative side of this is that endotherms require quite a lot of fuel to regulate temperatures, and our bodies can shut down pretty quickly if our cooling or heating systems fail and our temperature shifts even one or two degrees. 
Ectotherms are cold-blooded animals depend on their surrounding environments to regulate their body temperature, whether that be the sun or some shade in an underground burrow. An ectotherm's body temperature range is usually much wider than a human being's. An increase or decrease in temperature for a human being can be deadly. But for a lizard or a turtle, they actually have chemical responses that can protect them from excessive heat. Some of these animals can also go through some pretty extreme changes to survive being frozen as well. The wood frog, for instance, can survive up to 70% of its body being frozen during winter. This includes their brains and eyes and most of their external parts. The wood frog's heart can completely stop along with its breathing, but then when it's in frozen sometime in spring, it can actually come back to life as if nothing had happened. You see, the wood frog has nucleating proteins that can suck out the water from a frog's cell. At the same time, while that water is getting sucked out, the frog's liver creates glucose. This thick syrupy glucose substance has a much lower freezing point than water, so it doesn't turn into damaging ice crystals that will damage tissue and blood vessels. It's essentially like flooding your car with a syrupy antifreeze during the winter so your radiator doesn't crack and freeze. There are actually several other types of animals that use a similar method to prevent their bodies from basically being destroyed when they're frozen. Most of these animals are insects or ectothermic reptiles, which means that their bodies work slightly different from humans and most of the times are a bit less complex. As mammals and endotherms, our bodies have not adapted to tolerate massive changes in internal temperature. But there is one mammal that can survive below freezing temperatures, the Arctic ground squirrel. And if we can figure out how they manage hibernation, maybe we can unlock the secret of freezing humans without damaging their bodies. During winter, these little rodents burrow deep underground in order to avoid some of the harshest winters in the world. Not only is the weather extremely cold during the winter, there's also a lack of food. So once inside of their burrows, the Arctic ground squirrel sleeps and their body temperature falls from 99 Fahrenheit, which is roughly the same as a human's body temperature, down to 27 degrees, well below freezing temperatures. While most insects and reptiles who can survive freezing will flood their bodies with cryoprotectants and antifreeze proteins, these Arctic squirrels are able to produce a masking agent that neutralizes ice nucleators. Nucleation is the first step in the formation of a new thermodynamic phase. By preventing ice nucleators from forming inside of their bloodstream, this means that the Arctic ground squirrel doesn't actually freeze, but instead its body fluids reach a super cooled state. Now, currently, the idea of cryonics or freezing human bodies is only really done to human corpses. You guys have heard of that myth about Walt Disney freezing his body so that he could one day come back to life at the head of the multi-planet corporate empire of Disney in the future. Now, cryonics is mainly seen as a pseudoscience by the mainstream scientific community and for good reason. One is economic. Most of the bodies that were frozen in the 60s and 70s eventually had to be disposed of after companies that froze them went out of business. Cryonox is not a sustainable business model because no one is really sure when we'll figure out the technology to actually reanimate people from a variety of different you know, diseases. There's also an issue with uh, people believing in the system and actually signing up. There's just not that many new customers. Current cryonics use cryoprotectants to preserve the bodies and prevent them from being damaged under deep freeze. While these cryoprotectants are able to preserve cells and tissues and some smaller organs, larger organs tend to fracture during the freezing process, and when the bodies are thawed, you encounter even more problems. The whole system doesn't really work just yet. But then again, cryonics pushes the body temperatures to extremely low levels, and it's also used to preserve corpses. What we're looking at is putting live people into deep hibernation, not necessarily freezing them, completely. Currently, the European Space Agency is looking into placing astronauts in hibernation in preparation for future missions to Mars. And by hibernation, we're not talking about anything as extreme as what the Arctic ground squirrel goes through. Instead, we're talking about slowing down the metabolism to 75% of its base, which is similar to what large mammals like bears undergo during their winter hibernation. As we mentioned before, the journey to Mars will be long and expensive. If the astronauts can sleep most of the time, we can save a considerable amount of mass and supplies. Now, in 1999, radiologist Dr. Anna Bagenholm fell into a frozen stream while skiing in Norway. By the time they found her, she had been under the water for 80 minutes. She was labeled clinically dead, no pulse or breathing. Her body's temperature was measured at 56.7 degrees. This is extremely cold, but again, it's not freezing, so no ice crystals would have formed within her body. 
Despite her being technically dead, the doctors attempted to gradually warm her body. The key term here is gradual. Bagenholm was brought to an operating theater where a team of more than 100 medical professionals worked for nine straight hours to restart her body. They actually warmed her up by bringing her blood outside of her body, warming it in a machine, and then reserting it into her veins. But the next day, her heart restarted, and 10 days later, she awoke, although she was paralyzed from the neck down. She also had lung problems, so she was hooked to a ventilator. She also had problems with her kidneys and digestive system. But after months of recovery, she eventually fully recovered from her ordeal. Her situation was quite unique. Her body had actually cooled down significantly before her heart stopped. This cooling down slowed her metabolism to about a tenth of its normal speed. At that rate, the body needs very little oxygen, which is why her brain suffered no permanent damage at all. What happened to her was very similar to therapeutically induced hyperthermia, a method that is used in hospitals to save individuals who have problems with their circuitry system delivering blood to vital organs like the brain. So I think in the near future for month-long or year-long voyages, it seems like a medically induced hypernation might be one of the better ways to allow astronauts to sleep through longer voyages. Studies have actually shown that hibernation like this can protect an individual from radiation exposure. This is one of the bigger challenges that astronauts will face when venturing out of our protective electromagnetosphere. Hibernation will also decrease the effects that zero gravity will have on bones and muscle density, and also decrease the likelihood that astronauts will go insane and start murdering people. Therapeutically induced hypothermia is a pretty extreme measure and it's usually only used in like life-threatening uh, situations so that might not be exactly what we'll be doing to astronauts in the near future but slowing down our metabolism is kind of the key to I guess uh, near future space travel especially within our own solar system. Let me know in the comment section below if you guys know about any other methods to uh, help humans go into hibernation. I'm sure I've missed a few. Also don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual my name is Alan reminding you that life is a movie and you are a protagonist. The protagonist. Not a protagonist. The protagonist.